Sup, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. Well, after tackling the carnivore diet, which was a beast of a topic that resulted in my longest ever video on this channel, not to mention some triggered salad dodgers in the comment section, it's now officially back to skin and hair care witchery, which of course is the real focus of my channel. A topic that I get asked about a lot here is seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff. I get asked not only how to treat these conditions, but also whether they can actually worsen hair loss. These are great question chums, and I am happy to utilize my hair loss witchery to answer them. First of all, seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff are definitely related. They are both commonly thought to be due to the same process, and that's true. Dandruff really is just a milder form of seborrheic dermatitis that occurs specifically on the scalp. However, dandruff is a lot more common than full-blown seborrheic dermatitis. In the articles I reviewed, seborrheic dermatitis is seen in anywhere from 1-3% to of the population, or possibly up to 5% of the population. Dandruff, on the other hand, affects about half of the adult population. It's about as common as androgenic alopecia, in fact, and that is probably why every pharmacy and supermarket sells dandruff shampoos like Selsun Blue, Nizoral, and Head & Shoulders. So most people have a basic idea of what seborrheic dermatitis is, but let me go ahead and quote from one of the articles I reviewed that can probably explain it better than I can. Quote, Seborrheic dermatitis is a common chronic inflammatory skin disease characterized by erythematous, meaning red, scaly plaques with a yellow or white greasy appearance to the scales, but may have varied presentations depending on skin phototype age and anatomic location. Unquote. This is what it looks like in the scalp, but it also occurs in other areas with a lot of sebaceous gland activity like the forehead. So seborrheic dermatitis occurs in areas with a lot of sebum, in particular the scalp, the face, the chest, back areas, and the groin. Like I said, dandruff is basically just a milder form of seborrheic dermatitis which is confined to the scalp and consists of itchy and flaky skin without visible inflammation. Dandruff is also known by its scientific name, Pityriasis sicca. Anyways, one of the interesting things about seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff is that they are more common in men than women. This is probably because seborrheic dermatitis is linked to sebum production, and sebum production is stimulated by the trash hormone DHT. This negative effect of DHT was actually discovered back in 1993 by Julianne Imperato McGinley. If that name sounds familiar to you, then you probably watch my channel a lot since she is the same scientist who discovered that DHT caused androgenic alopecia way back in the 1970s, and her research helped pioneer the development of finasteride. So every hair loss witcher on planet Earth definitely owes Dr. Imperato McGinley a great deal of gratitude. She found that the 5 hair enzyme was responsible for sebum production in the skin in this article, and she proposed that it was the type 1 5 hair isoenzyme that was involved. This theory has officially been confirmed by other research. So seborrheic dermatitis can probably be added to the list of diseases caused by DHT, like prostate enlargement, hair loss, and acne. It really is a trash hormone. Since the type 1 5 hair isoenzyme is involved, finasteride probably wouldn't be very helpful since finasteride doesn't actually block the type 1 5 hair isoenzyme to any significant degree. Dutasteride, on the other hand, does block it though, so it's natural to ask whether dutasteride could possibly treat seborrheic dermatitis. I get asked that a lot on my channel. And even though the mechanistic theory is definitely promising, I could not find any studies using dutasteride for this very condition. And this may be because, like we'll soon see, seborrheic dermatitis is a multifactorial condition and sebum production is just part of the picture. That's also why dutasteride has had mixed results in treating acne. Acne is definitely related to sebum production, so you'd think that dutasteride would help, and maybe it does help, but acne is also related to other factors like bacteria and inflammation. This is yet another example as to why mechanistic data cannot be used to form conclusions, and I talked about that extensively in my carnivore diet video where I explained the mechanistic fallacy in great detail. So, even though both seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff are very common, their exact causes are still not completely understood. However, there seem to be three main factors involved. One of them is excessive sebum production, which we already mentioned. It turns out that seborrheic dermatitis happens most frequently during the periods of life when sebum production is at its highest. Seborrheic dermatitis is most common in infants less than 3 months old, in adolescents and young adults, and in adults over 50 years old. Dandruff, though, for some reason has a slightly different age distribution. It usually starts at puberty, and then it reaches its peak at around the age of 20. Then it becomes less prevalent when you reach the age of 50. So, like I said, there are at least three major factors that cause seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff. To quote from one of the articles I reviewed, quote, 
Three key factors are generally agreed upon, which are as follows. Lipid secretion by sebaceous glands, Malazesia species colonization, and some form of immunologic dysregulation, unquote. So, let me concentrate on the second factor, which is the fungus Malazesia. Malazesia is a form of yeast, and there are several different varieties. In addition to Malazesia, other microorganisms like staph may also be involved in causing the skin inflammation that's seen in seborrheic dermatitis. Here's what Malazesia can do to the skin. Malazesia secretes lipases and phosphates that hydrolyzes the sebaceous lipid to release unsaturated free fatty acids like oleic acid and arachidonic acid, which are believed to trigger the inflammation in seborrheic dermatitis." Unquote. However, we know that it's not just the presence of malazesia that causes seborrheic dermatitis, because malazesia is found on the skin of just about everyone, whether they have seborrheic dermatitis or not. So, there has to be a third factor that causes both seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff besides sebum production and malazesia, and that factor has to do with how an individual reacts to the malazesia on their skin. This figure here illustrates what is thought to happen when someone gets seborrheic dermatitis, or its less severe cousin, dandruff. There are five stages. First, there is excessive sebum production due to DHT and other factors. Second, the sebum on the skin gets colonized by malazesia. Third, the malazesia secretes lipases that convert the triglycerides in the sebum into free fatty acids and lipid peroxides that promote more malazesia growth and cause an inflammatory reaction. Fourth, the immune system generates cytokines that stimulate keratinocyte growth, which causes the fifth and final step, which is the disruption of the skin barrier. Like I said, dandruff really is just a milder form of seborrheic dermatitis, but without the inflammation. There is increased keratinocyte production so that the number of scalp skin cells that are shed with each hair wash almost doubles. This is related directly to the malazesia infection, but also can be worsened by other factors, like overwashing the hair, overcombing, or certain hair care products. So, like I said, the there are other factors involved in the cause of seborrheic dermatitis. For example, it does tend to run in families, and some genes have been identified that are associated with seborrheic dermatitis, so we can definitely say that there is a genetic and familial component with this disease. We also know that an abnormal immune response is part of the syndrome, because seborrheic dermatitis is common in immune-suppressed people, like people with HIV. It also, for some reason, is common in people with neurological diseases, like Parkinson's disease, stroke, and even depression, though maybe you could argue that depression could be the end result and not the cause of seborrheic dermatitis in at least some cases, similar to how depression is probably a consequence of hair loss as opposed to a side effect of finasteride. So, before we get into actual treatment, let's tackle the question in the title of this video. Does seborrheic seborrheic dermatitis actually cause hair loss? Well, the typical answer to that question is no, it doesn't cause hair loss. One problem is that seborrheic dermatitis can resemble other conditions that actually can cause hair loss, like tinea capitis, but true seborrheic dermatitis shouldn't cause hair loss. However, not every researcher agrees with this. For example, when people get telogen effluvium, they may also get seborrheic dermatitis, but in this case, it's probably the telogen effluvium that comes first, and the seborrheic dermatitis is related to the process that causes telogen effluvium. However, there have also been researchers who propose that possibly the inflammation from seborrheic dermatitis might actually cause a form of scarring alopecia that is reversible when the seborrheic dermatitis is treated. This form of hair loss, though, was definitely not a form of androgenic alopecia. Even Dr. Trug proposed in a paper that oxidative stress from seborrheic dermatitis might inhibit hair growth. Since ketoconazole shampoo has been shown to have a minor effect on hair growth in androgenic alopecia subjects, it's possible that the benefit might be from its antifungal effects, though it is also a weak 5 air inhibitor as well, so it might help in that regard too. I did a video on ketoconazole a few years ago, and I'll go ahead and link that below, but my general thoughts on the shampoo is that it probably does have some some mild benefits as an adjunctive therapy, but it certainly isn't on par with something like finasteride and certainly not even minoxidil. So it's possible seborrheic dermatitis might have some effect on hair growth, especially if the dermatitis is severe. Even if it didn't inhibit hair growth though, it is still worth treating, so let's go ahead and go over the treatment. The frontline treatment for seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff is to reduce the evil malazesia fungus on your scalp. A secondary line of defense is to use anti-inflammatory drugs to reduce the inflammation that is a response to the malazesia. The easiest mode of treatment is topical treatment, and the best delivery system is to have the treatment in the form of some kind of shampoo. And that's because people tend to shampoo frequently, and it's part of their daily routine, so if they're already shampooing, they might as well use a shampoo that is helpful for them. 
So most of the topical shampoos that are available to treat seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff will contain antifungal agents like ketoconazole, like I already mentioned. And many of these shampoos can be obtained over the counter, though a dermatologist can also prescribe you stronger versions of them, like Nizoral 2% as opposed to Nizoral 1%, which is the over-the-counter version. The most popular shampoos that are available will contain compounds like zinc pyrithion or selenium. And for example, Head & Shoulders contains zinc pyrithion, and Cells & Blue contains selenium, uh, selenium sulfate. So you can easily find these ingredients and a lot of different shampoos that you can find pretty much everywhere. Of course, like I mentioned, there's also ketoconazole, which is sold as Nizoral, and the ingredient is found commonly in other brands of shampoos, especially those marketed towards hair loss. There are also other antifungal ingredients you can find in various products like creams and shampoos, like bifonazole, myconazole, and cyclopyrox. So, the next step up in treatment is topical anti-inflammatory drugs. These include hydrocortisone creams and its derivatives, as well as immunomodulators like pimacrolimus and tacrolimus. Then there are some other topical treatments that work in other manners, like coltar shampoo, topical lithium, metronidazole, and even UVB light treatment. Finally, there are systemic antifungal agents that you can see here. So there are also some other agents that have been used that aren't mentioned in the tables I just showed you. These include things like tea tree oil, shampoo with salicylic acid, and even topical PDE4 inhibitors that have been used and have been shown to be effective. So if you have seborrheic dermatitis or dandruff, there is a broad range of options for treatment and many of them are easy to obtain over the counter. However, if you are not responding well to these treatments, there are two good reasons you should go see your dermatologist rather than go on Reddit or somewhere else online just to ask some random stranger. The first reason is that something that you may think to be seborrheic dermatitis could turn out to be something completely different and possibly could be something much more serious. There is a large list of conditions that can mimic seborrheic dermatitis. So rather than diagnosing yourself, you should go see your doctor who can confirm the diagnosis of seborrheic dermatitis by inspecting the scalp or even by using a scalp biopsy. The second reason to see your doctor is because he or she can recommend prescription strength medication and even oral medication to treat your condition if necessary. So that's basically the science behind seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff. So in conclusion, I think the biggest mistake people make when it comes to treating seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff is that they just self-diagnose themselves and find whatever treatment they can afterwards. It is definitely reasonable to try a simple treatment like head and shoulders first, possibly even before going to your doctor. But if that fails, you shouldn't rely on trial and error. You shouldn't just keep on buying and trying whatever product you can until you find out what works for you. You should see a doctor who can actually diagnose you and then recommend a specific treatment that is more effective for you. So even though dandruff and seborrheic dermatitis are largely caused by the same issue, there still may be some treatments that work better for some people compared to others, and you should let your doctor determine which treatment is best for you. So if you want to know more about the things I've personally used and have had success with in the past regarding dandruff, I'll go ahead and link my dandruff video below. But other than that, thank you. Thank you so much for watching Hair Loss Witchers. I'll be back with more content soon. God bless.